Hello again, as we continue this celebration of the best of our offbeat comics, what a performance. That was a catchphrase coined by the great character comedian Sid Field, and it's an expression I've often used after experiencing Spike Milligan. Spike's always been the most daunting of guests because you could never be sure what he'd get up to. It frequently made for exciting television, especially if you're the sort of person who watches Formula One for the crashes. But if you were the host of the show, Spike's wilder antics could give you a serious laundry problem. I uh, first saw Spike 50 plus years ago. I watched from the wings of the Golders Green Hippodrome as Spike did the audience warm up before a very famous radio show of the day called Variety Bandbox. Frankly, it wasn't so much a warm up as a cremation. And beside me, the producer was muttering, he's killing the show. And every joke was going down in total silence. And then suddenly Spike dropped his trousers. And the audience howled with laughter. And he shouted, ah ha ha, so it's subtle to you, wank. And dropped his underpants as well. With the goons, of course, he went on to give comedy a new dimension. And his Q series for BBC Two really opened the door for the Pythons to charge through. You know, you can be only 30 years old, but if your first joke doesn't get a laugh, you can be 80 in a hurry. And if you're 80 and you get laughs in a hurry, then you get to be 30. Spike will always be 30. Ahoy, me hearties! Oh, I get along without you very well. There was a time when I had one of these. <laughs> Be a leg donor. Nobody who worked with him ever doubted that he was a genius. Genius is not a word we should toss around. It's only show business. Einstein was a genius. That's cosmology. This, this is just comedy. And being Irish, I suppose, it makes a difference. As I say, the Irish think sideways. I think the best, the best word that describes his sense of humour is um, anarchic. <laughs> Although he was still very capable of, of digging out the old musical jokes and uh, saw nothing wrong with doing that. Behold, pray thou sinners, prepare to meet thy doom! <laughs> what appealed to me about the goon shows was that it was, uh, you know, when you said, uh, you have somebody saying, money talks. Ah, I'm a threatening bit. I did Eddie Gidding Archie and other shows and did the goon show as, as, as a sort of uh, relief, really. And then the goon show took over. But it was entirely different from anything else. Um, we rode on the thermal currents of old Milligan's imagination. That was it. You anti-Bismarck swine! I showed! No, no, not through the glass. You'll break it. First, I'll make a hole in it. Put. Ridiculous. That's the word. <laughs> Who is it? Who is it? Who is it? Over the door at once, and we break it down. Where did you get a name like that? <laughs> Before comedy was straightforward and not very funny, really, when he thought about it. But uh, he, he, you had to use your mind. You had to listen carefully. <laughs> that lovely melody that I have recorded for my latest film, which is now showing north of the river, and it's called, If I Had to Do It All Over Again, I'd Do It All Over You. <laughs> what Spike would try to do is just squeeze names into the script that the censor, the censorious figures wouldn't notice. And Milligan in The Goons had an acrobatic act called Novak and Good. And people complained about it, especially when they got a third member and they were known as still Novak and Good. He's got a mind like nobody else in the world, Milligan. It's uh, completely off the wall. And yet it's brilliant, you know. <laughs> Yesterday, all my trouble seemed so far away. Now, it's a door to get a stay. Oh, I believe it. Yesterday, <laughs> suddenly, suddenly, I'm just half the man I used to be. What I liked about his show, what I like about him, is that he plays with the form of the whole thing. You know, it's all unexpected. There's very little on that show that you could ever predict, really. Chief Constable Sir Robert Road Safety Commercial. Would you, in your own words, tell us exactly what the police reaction is to this very serious charge? <laughs> the 
<laughs> Sir Robert, thank you. They didn't understand the humour. They were baffled by it. But it, it was getting fan mail. And uh, that's why they kept it on. It was very brave of them, you know. I mean, a spike sort of uh, uh, was always a kind of a model in my mind, and I assume in, in the others, for this, this surrealist leap of the imagination. Spike could always encapsulate, you know, sort of a, a jump from one idea to another that just made you go, blah. And it hit the sandwich and it stops playing. It's as if... But the great thing about that is, it's as if that that sandwich shop, it's happening all the time. So he's always got an hammer ready. The owner says, oh, not another one. Poof. You see what I mean? It makes you think. I must go down to the sea again, to the lonely sea and the sky. <laughs> <laughs> and all I ask was a tall zip. I think Spike didn't... Didn't think punch lines were, were terribly important, basically because he couldn't think of any, and uh, so there were <laughs> found ways out of it. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Would you be a witness to this vile robbery? Yes. New bastard. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, we finish the sketch. <laughs> he gives the viewer an incredible amount of license for understanding what's going on. He doesn't need to wrap it all up in bows. If you've had enough fun, then let's do this. So it's not so much a lack of punchline, it makes perfect sense. Yes, what are we going to do now? All right, we can carry on walking around, uh, but, you know, with these noses on and, and finish this off in a wah-wah trumpet. Or um, they can start striking the set and I'll say, what are we going to do now? And because it's telly, we can cut to something else. That encourages that reaction. Hey, <laughs> what? Like your family. And then you laugh, and you laugh then. You see, you do get a laugh, because you get a laugh because uh, 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 you laugh for the wrong reason. But I like that. That, that I like that idea of that kind of premeditated. Well, you know, bollocks to you. You're not getting a punchline. He's not afraid of stereotypes at all because he defies you to say they're not funny. They are. That's how they became stereotypes. Lots of stereotypes are very funny, and he knows that. In 1970, the Irish attempted to enter the moon race. Anything to escape from the Irish race. <laughs> While in 1972, Scotland launched its own programme to put a man into space. <laughs> He's not a PC man. Um, I vaguely remember he, he, there was one in a queue, there was a rabbi playing a till. I remember, um, and he always used to black up a lot. I think, again, that has to be seen in context of the time. Um, as I say, you know, when you actually watch 70s television, it is incredible what, how people were very happy to make racist jokes. It's going to be racist. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> of course, you did not make racist because he was a Pakistani conductor. Pakistani conductor doesn't mean. Shut up. And Spike does the uh, Asian characters, and a lot of today people killed it. So Spike grew up in India, and he genuinely does not feel the need to explain himself. He says, I love India. I grew up in India, where it doesn't agree with your quantification of what the Asian state, that is my experience, and I defy you, and I deny you the right to second-guess me, which a lot of his humour is about. Senor, you tell which man will make all the trouble for you. Oh, not that man, no. No, not him. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, don't Not to him. Indian Pakistani Dalek. What he did in the gutty? <laughs> yeah, it's pure spike. Absolutely. I mean, I do like it, but it's uh, what he was thinking of. How's Mr. Banerjee? He's not terribly well. Why? I exterminated him. <laughs> The only aspect of Spike that's gone out of date was the only aspect that was never really in fashion, and that is he was not 
politically correct. In a big way, he wasn't. And he had views that were indistinguishable from race prejudice, and he'd had them since the war. Spike was really shaken up in North Africa. It's between the lines, it's in the lines of his books. And uh, he would unblushingly refer to Arabs as wogs and so on. It's not that you can't do it now. You couldn't do it then. I resent being told what to do. And uh, the world is full of people telling people what to do. I think Spike hates authority in any form. I just booked a bloke called Maria. <laughs> and suddenly that night will never be destroyed. <laughs> You know, if you're going to be psychoanalytic about it, it would be the same thing about being kids. It would be like uh, authority represents parental figures, grown-upness, all the rest of it, how you should behave, and that, uh, therefore, the bigger the authority figure, Hitler <laughs> or whatever, you know, uh, the more liable they are to be, you know, to, make, to be made to look stupid. Deutschland, Deutschland, Jubel! <laughs> Hitler himself, uh, Spike finds, is the funniest character in the 20th century, but uh, as, as, he, as he would, uh, in, a, in a defiant way and in, in a quite true way. And he feels he earned the right to laugh at Adolf Hitler. He was a twit. T-W-I-T, pronounced... <laughs> Spike never minded going where nobody else would want to go. And if he told people he was going there, they would have tried to stop him if they were TV controllers. In fact, a lot of that happened. If he'd told anyone, look, I want to be Hitler singing a George Formby song, they probably would have tried to shut him down. Because somehow he got on the air and did it. Nice little buddies. Don't be fighting the granddad. Come on. There, all for you. <laughs> I slavishly copied him. No, I mean, what I took off him was the, was the way that you didn't... You, I don't think you really have to have that polish. A lot of presentation on TV, I think, is to do with, you know, polish that's unnecessary. The most important thing is the gag and the, the material, really. After being savaged by an aardvark at London Zoo today, <laughs> a keeper was assured by his doctors not to worry because aardvark never killed anybody. <laughs> Reports are coming in about a horse in a tree. <laughs> well, that's it tonight, except... except for another report about a horse in a tree. So, good night. I don't know whether they think I'm dead, but nobody's commissioned me to write for the last ten years. I think some of the BBC must be laying flowers in a grave and mistaken identity in Highgate Cemetery, believing it to be me. Maybe it is. <laughs> I'm not going to thank anybody because I did it all on my own. Personally, I think the mic was in order. <laughs>